remember the interesting thing about Matthew, the book of Matthew, it, it kind of a, a thing you learn when you read the first chapter is you pay attention to the conjunction day because he uses it roll through his book in the most interesting way to divide sections. Uh, and the way Matthew is using this word, which is often translated and, but, then, it's, it's got a lot of different translations in the English. But kind of what he has done in the book of Matthew with it is show you events. And that's kind of interesting. So you kind of keep your eye out for the, when you're studying the book of Matthew in at least the New American Standard. I didn't pay any attention to the other translations but you want to pay attention to the word now. I just for example, uh, verse verse 18 begins with now. Second chapter opens with now. Um, third chapter opens with now. And you just kind of keep an eye on that. Uh, and a lot of times it's the word now and it's translated and or something. But you want to keep, and when you see it, you know that he's moving, he's moving the events from the birth of Christ to the cross. And so it's just kind of interesting, but we that's introduced by now in verse 18 is introduced as the events begin to unfold from the birth of Christ to the crucifixion, burial, and resurrection. We're down, and and the word day is used six times. It's used in, in 18. It introduces 18, and this is kind of interesting because he uses it six times to introduce the birth of Christ. He does it in 18, 19, 20, 21. And then, and by the way, those are all Greek sentences as well. And then uh, verses 22 and 23 is a Greek sentence. He introduces it with day there. Verse 24, 25 is a Greek sentence. He introduces it there. And from there, he runs this book. But you can see how heavy in that idea that he's using. And, and therefore, he's using the, the conjunction now in a most interesting way. Those of you that have been with, with me through the Hebrew part of Genesis saw him do it. The, the writer did it with Kai because Kai can be used that way in the Hebrew. Um, uh, that's what the, we would say it, in the, how we would say it uh, from the Greek and the English. But it, it's just kind of interesting. So we're down into 22, 23. So 18 was a big event. See, he's talking about big events. 18 is a big event. 19 is a big. Now, when you look at 18 through 25, you think of it as one big event. And, of course, it is in the fact that it's the birth story. But there are eight events in that birth story that Matthew thinks are dynamite. Uh, anyhow, at least that's my conclusion. And so we're down into verse 22, 23. Remember that the angel of the Lord, more than likely Gabriel, he's not called Gabriel in Matthew, but he is in Luke. And so we assume this angel of the Lord, as he's identified by Luke as Gabriel, um, we assume that's who this is, at least I do. And, and remember that Gabriel shows up uh, in in his dream, you remember that, in his dream. And his involvement in the birth story is verses 20 through 23. So when you read the birth story, you want to keep up with, if this was a movie, here are the three key actors in it. These are the three key stars. Jo well, actually, we since it's about Joseph, Joseph, Mary, and Gabriel. I mean, that's the three, if this, was a, if this was a play, a drama, a movie, or whatever, this would be the three key people in it. And so, verse tw uh, Gabriel's part is verses 20 through 23. Okay, so we begin with Joseph, concerned about Mary, right? And Mary... You, Mary would never be on stage. She would always be identified by his dreams, wouldn't she? <clears throat> Until the very end when he awakes and go gets her. Uh, you girls know about that, don't you? Huh? Most of us are in a fog until we walk down the aisle and we go like, 
geez, what just happened to me? Um, that's, I didn't hear one boo, thank you. Uh, verse 22, 23. Uh, and all of this took place. Now, look, this is kind of like a footnote. And he's telling you, uh, Gabriel shows up in 2021. And he gives us a footnote of things that occurred that were major. Things that were major. See, verse, verse 20 was a sentence. Verse 21 was a sentence. And now he moves to like a footnote. Now all this took place. Talking about Gabriel's interaction with um, Joseph. Now all this took place that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled saying, and then he, he quotes Isaiah 7, 14, behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son and they shall, shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated from Hebrew to Greek to English and it doesn't change means God with us. The Hebrew word means it. The Greek word means it, and the English word means it. And when he says translated, for us, that's been translated out of the Hebrew into the Greek and into the English, and not a bit of it's been changed. Isn't that wonderful? That's the word. This is where you get the idea of hermeneutics, which is uh, a, a part of theological training, hermeneutics. That's where, that's where you get it in the Hebrew. The, the Greek word is where you get... When you look at the Greek word in a moment, you'll see that's where you get the word hermeneutics. Uh, God with it. So that's what we're going to look at today after a word of prayer. Let's have a word of prayer. For those that are with us both by automobile and by the Internet, you need to be mindful of this. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't study it in carnality, nor can you live it in carnality. You can't learn it nor live it. In carnality, evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be in a category of mental attitude sins. It could be sins of the tongue or revert sins. These need to be confessed to move out of carnality and back to spirituality because the Holy Spirit is what makes you spiritual. And he dwells within you from the point of salvation forever. John 14, 16. And so... You know, you need to be spiritual to learn it. You need to be spiritual to live it. And so here we are in learning. So 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's a wonderful thing that has been extended from the cross to the Christian life. Confession of sin. And it has nothing to do with the, the salvation aspect. It has to do with the spirituality concept of our Christian life and, and for learning the word of God and for living the word of God. Father, we're so thankful tonight for these have come our way, both by the automobile and by the internet. If you live within 20, 30 miles of us, we'd like to have you actually come and participate with us in person under the principle, maybe, maybe the principle of Hebrews 10, 25, not to forsake the assembling. And for us, that assembling is live, personal, fellowshiped out as well as Bible study. Being identified with people who are of the same mind with one another and get to know them, have the opportunity to pray with them and minister with them in a local setting. So we pray that today, Father. Pray the Holy Spirit would once again teach us great relevant truth out of the life and experiences of Joseph recorded in the Bible for our well-being, spiritual. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in Matthew 1, 20 and 21, we studied Joseph's first life-changing experience with the behold moment we talked about. You pay attention to that word behold in the Bible as well. Uh, in uh, that birth story in the verses 20, 21, 
in that first behold moment, Gabriel gave three future declarations regarding the birth of Christ in verse 21 that were dynamite. You have one Greek sentence with three main verbs. They're sequential. And that's a pretty powerful idea. That's a pretty powerful idea. I mean, you're really, you're really, that, what he's doing with that is this is point one, two, and three, and they are really important. That's the way Matthew tells you, talks to you when he does that. One verse with three main verbs. <laughs> it's, it's dynamite. And when he does it, they're, they're like markers. He's saying this is point one, this is point two, and this is point three, and boy, you'd better get this. <laughs> this is really important. So that's in verse 21. In Matthew 123, within our study tonight, we will study Joseph's second behold moment in the birth story of Christ. In the second behold moment, verse 23, if you look down there on your, in your book, Bible, behold, he says, behold, there it is. And listen, he's quoting Isaiah 4, uh, 7, 14. The word behold is a really interesting word, and I'll talk about it in a moment. Uh, I don't know what behold means to you. For, for, uh, for maybe a more English idea of it, it's an exclamation, and it would be, look! It's a bird, it's a plane. No, it's Superman. No, behold, that's what they say. We would say, look! Did you just see that? What was that? Oh, it's a meteor. No, it was going across the sky, not down. Oh, it's a UFO. Okay. That's the word behold. I don't know that we get all that out of the word behold, but we should. <laughs> because it means that in the Greek language. And so it's, it's used sometimes, this word behold. It's used verbally as an exclamation or an interjection. And, and you know, in, the, in movies, if you go to movies or if you watch them, you always pay attention to the music, right? Because the music tells you where you're going. If it gets, if it's going to be high drama, it'll get you into high drama, <laughs> right? And you, you, you know when it's going to be a little oh, sweet kind of little thing, and then you know that you know if they're going to kiss by the way the music goes with it and all that kind of stuff. And then they're about to have a fight. And, oh yeah, here it comes, and the movie just carries you along, doesn't it? It's the music that carries you along with the with the line. And, and after a while, after you go two or three movies, you don't even pay attention to it anymore because you're hooked. I mean, you, it just does it. And, and listen, if it's not there, you miss it. If you see some of the old movies that don't have all that, that hasn't, hasn't not attached all of the importance of the music in it, it's like, you know, put me to sleep. If it wasn't popcorn, I'd already gone to bed. All right, so second behold moment. Again, what's, what's kind of important to us in the first behold moment, it led after the first behold moment, it led into three future declaratives, main verbs. Once again, he's done it again. In the second behold moment, Gabriel gave three more future declarations. It's in the future tense regarding the birth of Jesus. And it's another one of the now all of a sudden, we're going to get really get, get important. This is going to be important to us because it's a pr prophetic word, Isaiah 7, 14. But he does it once again. He does it once again. So look at what he does is kind of interesting because we're still talking about Gabriel, Gabriel's effect, a message affecting and how will he respond. Gary, that was a great a great message you brought the other day on react response. That was a wonderful message, by the way. I mean, if it, anybody didn't hear that, it's well worth uh, go back and pull it up all from our archives and listen to last Sunday, the second half. That was an excellent movie uh, on it. And, and, and I was about to say movie, wasn't I, uh, on it. So, but here's what he does. We're still in that, we're still in the drama of, of the appearance uh, in a dream of Gabriel bringing the, the message to Joseph because Joseph's in a crisis in his life and he's got to make a decision. He's made a decision, but he's, is, it, it, will be, it will be put into motion in the morning. And, and so what he does 
in this, the, what Matthew does, he interrupts the program. He interrupts the program with an announcement. He, he get, you know, like if, a, if something is interrupted and they're going to give an emergency alert, they interrupt it, they tell you what is about it, and then, right, and they catch you with music too, don't they? They interrupt it and it's kind of, you know, rough and everything. You go like, oh my. And, and so he does it. Watch this now. He does this in verse 22. Watch what he does. Matthew introduced it. He says, now there's your day. That's the fifth of six sequences. Now all this took place. You know what that, what that interprets into our life? Listen, the geographical will, the operational will, and the mental will that's associated with the direct will of God. All of this took place. What was that? That's the plan of God unfolding in events. And it has come now to Joseph geographically, he's got to understand, listen, when you get the directive will of God, it's going to involve three things in your life. You've got to pay attention to it. It's, it's geographical. It's operational. It's mental. There are, three, there are three phases that you have to address in the directive will of God. And if you pay attention to the story of Joseph, you will see that. He introduced all this took place, that is geographic, operational, mental will of God, to fulfill What's he fulfilling? The directive will of God. To fulfill the directive will of God, which was spoken from, by the Lord through the prophet, listen, 700 years ago is now about to be fulfilled. Is about to be fulfilled. I, I did a sermon Sunday on the will of God in motion, which is really important for you to understand because it happens in our life all the time. If you're in a spiritual growth momentum, the plan of God, and you have a chance to step into that motion and go with it in an important role. That's why it's so important to stay positive in the word of God, stay consistent with your walking in the spirit, stay consistent with your faith cycle because you, at, at any given day, at any given moment, the Father is going to bring along a situation in your life. Now, you're flowing with the will of God anyhow. But what we're talking about, events. Certain events in your life. And these events, you never forget. You never forget them. These are the kind of events in your life you never forget. They are, they are benchmarkers in your life. We all have them, don't we? You have some out of grammar school. As far as back I can go, you can get you got some in grammar school, you got some in high school, you got some in college, you got some in your early marriage. You, you know, you know what I mean. There, there are certain benchmarks. These are events in your life that that are there forever. And listen, I've seen people who couldn't remember what they did yesterday that are still connected with those benchmarks. That's really interesting to me. It gets more interesting every day, by the way. Now, all this took place, all this took place to fulfill God's will, directive will, we call it, which was spoken by light through the prophet. Then he comes, now he's done his introduction, and now he comes to Joseph's second behold moment. He says to Joseph, behold, and notice I, I, th this word is the most, this, this is the word horeo. If you're looking for a root word of idos, if you're looking for a root word, this is an aorist active imperative. It's an aorist imperative. It's a command. I mean, that's dynamite. If you're looking for it, it's horeo. Now, horeo normally, listen to me now, this is important. Around here, at least, it's important because we teach from the languages. Horeo normally means what you see in the mind's eye as opposed to blippo, what you see with the natural eye. Right? Somebody says, you're struggling with something, you can't figure it out, and he comes, well, here's how it works, and he does this and that, and you go like, and the light bulb goes off. And he says, you got it? And you go like, oh, yeah, boy, have I got it. But if you'd have put that wire in the wrong place, you'd have been electric, you know? <laughs> so um, that's horeo. Now, pay attention to me, because that's the word that's used here. In the root word is horeo. And when it's used, it wants you to do the same thing but with something external, not internal. See, horeo is normally internal, what the mind eye sees. 
this is external. It's the, what the inner eye sees externally. And what he's talking about is Isaiah 714. And he introduces Isaiah 714, not as a prophetic word out there with the word behold, but you really need to pay attention to this one. You need to understand, Joseph, how this is connected to what you're struggling with right here in your life. You see that? Can you connect? Here's what he's saying in the word behold. Can you connect Isaiah 7, 14 with Mary's pregnancy? Can you do that, Bubba? You know Isaiah 7, 14, or I wouldn't have brought it up. I'd have brought another scripture up. You got that one in your soul. You didn't use it, but it was there. You didn't use it. You didn't investigate it. But now that I tell you that, did that light bulb go off with Mary? Is that not, is that, is that, Please tell me you read 2021. <laughs> Do you see the word? That's the word behold. That is the word behold. And now he lays it out. He says, he says, the virgin, the word he there is a definite article with a spotlight on the virgin of Isaiah 7, 14. The virgin shall be, there's, there's your first future declarative, with child, and shall bear, that's your second future declarative, shall bear a son, no definite article. It's about to come. The definite, he holds a definite article because the, the, big, the big point has not been made yet. The big point hasn't been made yet. And so he's a son. And they, the people of Israel, to whom he comes to, and to whom, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. The son that Mary's carrying, that's going to be born six months from now, Joseph, is not for you and Mary. It's for they. It's for us. And it's for they, the people. It's for the people. I mean, how important is it for Joseph to get this? Because Joseph is running down a wrong path. And, and, and listen, he doesn't need to go there and actually doesn't want to go there. But he's made a false assumption and has run off from that false assumption. And they shall call his name. You remember when he talked to Joseph earlier? He said to Joseph, and you're going to call his name Jesus. Remember that? You're going to call his name Jesus. He said, you're going to, you are going to name this son that Mary's carrying. If, if you participate in my program, then the next thing on the list, remember I said that, the next thing on the list for you is to name him. Eight days old, he's going to name him. You're going to name him Jesus. It tells him why. Because he's going to save his people from their sin. He's going to save their people from their sin. Now he comes back to they. He, they. he knows because he said this son is come for the sins of the people of Israel, right? right. Mm -hmm. They got to keep it all in context. And they shall call his name Emmanuel. Now we... He left the definite article off the son to introduce you to who the son is, Emmanuel. Emmanuel. See the word Emmanuel? You know how it ends? What's that end in? E-L. Circle it. Because you know what that is? God. Do you know what everything else in that word is? with us that's a whole lot of stuff in it i m m a n u in the hebrew brought into the greek 
all of that is with you, with us, and the E-L is God. That's a long word to get to God, isn't it? Listen, God chooses names for a reason. You always pay attention to whoever God names somebody. You always pay attention because it's a big part of their life. In the New Testament, it is not the name we have that bears the big role. It's the name that we, that we covet the most of all the names on the earth is the name of Jesus Christ. When we bear that name, we have the name above every name. In the Old Testament, he chose names because we were going to the names, names that led us to the name that was above every name, the name of Jesus. And he calls him Jesus, who they were looking for the Christ. He calls him Jesus is the Christ. And when he raised him from the dead, calls him the Lord, Jesus Christ. I think sometimes we take this name Jesus kind of like a Coca-Cola or something. But this is, this, is, this is not a brand among brands. This is a name above every name. This is not Coca-Cola and Pepsi and R Buffalo Rock. The name of, this is a name above every name, whether it be in heaven, on earth, under the earth. And he says, this is the name Emmanuel, and Emmanuel means God with us. And how important is that name? Now, we call, we pray to him as Jesus. We refer to him as Jesus Christ. We refer to him as our Lord. We refer to him a lot of tender ways. But who he always is to our life is Emmanuel. He comes into your life. He is with you for the long haul and beyond. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you, neither in time nor eternity. And don't let anybody tell you you can lose what God gives you. Not under grace. Can't lose your salvation. Don't let people tell you that. Salvation is not based on you. It's based on him. You're saved by grace through faith, not of yourself. It's a gift of God. It's not probation. That's right. That's right. Got that right. So, one of the interesting things as well is that when the Greek, when, when they wrote this thing, God with us, they, they gave you a manual, and then, and then in the Greek, they explained, in the Greek, they explained God, put a definite article with God, and then with us, he put it meta plus the genitive. Meta, genitive can be used in a lot of different ways. This is called the genitive of accompaniment. I can't tell you how important that is. God with us. Like Hebrews 13, 5, God will never forsake you nor leave you. You know why? Because he's with you. He is with you. He accompanies you. You know who posts guard on you when you sleep? God. You know who posts guard on when you're awake? God. You know who posts on you all the days of your life on earth? God. You know when you die and you go to heaven? Who posts? It? God. You know, it's all about God is with you. Listen, listen to me now. This is important. God is with you even when you're not with God. Think about that. Second, Second Timothy 2.13. God is faithful in, even when you're unfaithful. I mean, this is a wonderful God. <laughs> Jeez, a wonderful God to send his only son to die for the worst person in the world and take everybody else with him, with it. <laughs> Jeez, I mean, we, we wouldn't even live across the street from the worst person in the world. We would move if he wouldn't. Wouldn't you? Well, who would do that? I mean, if you, you're not going to live. So let's look at a few things. It is possible in the life of Joseph, here are some things we learn. It is possible, and listen to me closely, because this possibility could be in our life. It is possible as a believer, it is possible to be committed to doing the directive will of God, the thing that God has revealed in your life that's, that you should be doing. 
it's possibly committed to doing the direct will of God and yet become entangled, entangled in subjective human viewpoint thinking. I say it all the time in marriage disputes. You know what an argument's about? Two, two subjective people. Nobody's objective in it. You're not hearing me. I know you're shouting. Well, you're not listening. Yeah, I'm listening. What's that all about? What's those terms tell you about? No, no objectivity there. Well, anyhow. It's possible to be committed to doing, in your heart, to doing the directive will of God and yet become entangled in subjective human viewpoint thinking, which results in a false assumption. That this is a life of Joseph now that leads you down a path that takes you out of the directive will of God. How about that? He is on a path that's going to take him out of the directive will of God. And listen, that wasn't based on negative volition to God's revealed truth. Think about that for a moment. How do I know that? Because when he's told what the revealed will of God is about this specifically, he, he goes along with it. He goes like, he salutes and does the same thing that Mary did. Salutes and drives forward. That's verse 24 and 25. He wakes up and does what the Lord commanded. Whoa. I mean, the, one young kid, when I taught this one time, he said, well, listen, that's the easy part, isn't it? Sleeping, doing the will of God. It's the tough part. It's in the morning when you get up. And that's the truth. It wasn't for him. You know why? Because he wanted to do the will of God. He thought he was doing the will of God. Right? Exactly. In his heart, he believed that. We know that because of his response when he saw, oh, sh I didn't, Isaiah 7, 14, why didn't I do that? Well, you jump. you got subjective too quick. You didn't stay objective. You got subjective. What should he do? Subjectivity is flesh. That's human viewpoint. You went flesh. What he should have done is went into prayer, sought the, sought the Lord. The Lord, listen, the Lord would have given it to him without sending it, the top angel, top gun. Glad again. Well, of course. And isn't he glad? Listen, because I guess you could say his heart's in the right place. But, but, but it's about positive volition. It's truth. Listen. He, he's not doing this out of negative volition to God's, God's revealed truth because when it's given, he goes like, I, geez, I could have had a V8. <laughs> what we call a mistake, listen, what we call mistakes, I hear this all the time. Well, I made a big mistake, Pastor. What we call mistakes is an afterthought. We call them mistakes. What we call them in true, true real time is making wrong decisions and choices. They're not mistakes. See, that's a cover-up. That's a cover-up from becoming very subjective that you lost your objectivity. I was just throwing that out. That's, that's extra. I don't fault Joseph. Listen, I do not fault Joseph for the decision to divorce based on his assumption of adultery. I don't fault him for what his assumption was. All right? It was false, but I don't, because listen, 100% of 100 people would probably agreed with Joseph that were active in his church. And they would have all been wrong from a human viewpoint, you see. Joseph was so sure that his assumption about Mary's pregnancy, adultery, and his right for divorce that one might assume that he would, it would be nearly impossible to change his mind. But it wasn't, was it? When he heard the truth about Isaiah 7, 14, boom. Now he's got to dig himself out of a guilt kind of thing, Right? Oh, my goodness, look what I could. Bet you didn't, Joseph. Get over it. But you didn't go through with it. You didn't go through with it, so get over it. 
I don't know that happened. I'm just saying. That would have been Ron Ademeyer. <laughs> but he yells. Point number two, Joseph was a spiritual mature believer and a mature student of the Bible, yet he made an immature believer error. He walked by sight, didn't he? There's only two options for your life. When you got to come to this, you either walk it out by faith or you walk it out by sight. There's no in between them, right? 2 Corinthians 5, 17, walk by faith, not by sight. Listen, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we walk by, that's dia plus the ablative of means, we walk by means of faith, faith cycle, not by the means of sight. See, he ran his whole program off the of sight, human viewpoint. It wasn't involved in Cosmos Diabolicus. It was just subjective human viewpoint. This word sight's an interesting word too, idos. The word sight in idos means to denote something external rather than internal viewpoint of a rail. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? The same thing, that's that word behold like. This is this word, sight. That word behold. Isn't that interesting? That's the concept. And what he's talking about in Horeo here in 2 Corinthians 5, 7 is ra rationalism or empiricism as opposed to faith, as opposed to faith. And, and, and look, you know what? Both of those, when you go by sight, you know what it does? It produces pessimism in you, not optimism. You, you show me a Christian that's pessimistic, I'll show you a guy that walks by sight, not by faith. Faith is the most, it's the most positive thing you can do in your life is walk by faith. It, it makes every day fresh and new and bright. Every day. No matter what's on your plate. You meet, a, you meet a Christian who is a pessimist, and I'll show you a guy who walks, tries to walk out his, his life by sight and not by faith. Faith is optimistic. Caleb. You know, I mean, the Bible's full of these people. We need to be those people. We live in the most pessimistic society in the whole world, and it's in the church as well. It drives me nuts. By walking by sight, Joseph believed that he had two options regarding divorce. I could do it privately, and I could do it publicly. However, he discovered there was only one needed. There was only one needed. And neither one of them were options. Neither one of us were right. Joseph, well, I got two options. God says, no, you haven't got two options. In fact, the two options you got is out. You have one option, and that one option is to marry Mary if you want to participate in the plan. You're going to have to marry Mary. <laughs> See, nobody does. Even God didn't do it. He didn't even do it that way. He said, he told him to take Mary as your wife because he, he wasn't, no, nobody will get that. Marry Mary. Mary, Mary, they have a little lamb, and there you go. They can't do that. He should have searched the scriptures. Listen, here's what he knows in hindsight. He should have searched the scripture, listen to me, on the main issue. This should not have been, listen, an immature believer would have understood what is your issue. Go to the Bible and what the issue is. The issue in this story is a Jewish virgin in the house of David is pregnant. Is that not the issue? All this other stuff is gobbledygook. That's the main issue, and he never looked up what the Bible says about the main issue. He didn't do it. He assumed what 100% of 100 people would probably assume about copulation and pregnancy. Right? But this is an exception. Is there an exception? Isaiah 7, 14 was the exception, and it was a well-known one. He didn't... years hopefully not while you're in asleep all the time listen 
if he'd have done, if he'd have looked at the main issue, and, and, and but he can't because he went what? To look at the main issue, he would have had to remain objective. He didn't, he went subjective, right? He reacted rather than respond. That's, you know, that's what. So, listen, I, I don't fault him for doing that. But listen, he made, a, he made a, an immature believer mistake. He walked by sight, not by faith. It should have, listen, and had he done, had he, had he kept them, had he looked at the main thing and kept the main thing, the main thing as Horton used to say, right? Then it would have saved him from a whole lot of self-inflicted misery, right? We call it self-induced misery. Here's my third point. Notice that when Gabriel arrived, he gave Joseph specific scriptural revelation on his problem. He's saying to Joseph what I just said, keep the main thing the main thing. The problem is Joseph don't have the main thing. <laughs> you can't keep the main thing the main thing when you're not in the, don't have the main thing. Okay. Listen, I love this verse. It's Philippians 2.13. You probably know it, but you just didn't know where it came from. For it is, for it is God who, as, who is at work within you. Do you know? Now, when does that begin? Listen, when you get saved, that's when he works within you, who works within you, not working outside of you, but now working from the inside out, not from the outside in. Before you get saved, God works from the outside in. Once you get saved, he works from the inside out. For it is God who is at work in you. Watch this. Watch this now. Both to will and to work. You know what that is? That's the faith cycle. Listen, I, I, I do this all the time with you. Here's the will. Here is the work, right? Yes. Hearing, believing, applying, completing. You look at it, here's the will side, here's the work side. And who's, do, who's doing the, who, who's will? God. Who's work? Yeah, remember that. I don't see yours up there. It's your faith. It's his work. It's your faith. See, here's my faith, faith in the will of God. Here it is, faith that God will do the work. See, that's Romans 4.21, what God has promised he will do. And so if you learn that and live that, it will, it will revolutionize your life. That little deal on the board will revolutionize your life. Life. If there's a message other than the gospel of Christ that people ought to learn, that's one of them. That's a, that's a main deal. Keep the main thing the main thing. That's the main thing. Listen, this is why it's important for God to work to his will and his work of his, of his good pleasure, of his good pleasure. <laughs> listen, Joseph, listen, here's the truth of reality. Joseph knew that Mary was a virgin to him. <laughs> All right, listen, Mary knew that she was a virgin to the Lord. She said it. And the Lord knew Mary was a virgin to God. And that makes a great story for God's plan to move through believer's life. You know what Mary did? Listen to what Mary did. Now she, there's no doubt she was, she, she was crazy about this old boy. But not crazy, not crazy like most women are. Not crazy like most women are. She stayed pure to the Lord. No matter what he said, didn't matter how he countered all of her arguments why we shouldn't do this. She stayed faithful to the Lord. She stayed faithful to the Lord. Joseph knew Mary was a virgin to him. Mary knew she was a virgin to the Lord, and the Lord knew Mary was a virgin to God. And listen, God is trying to pull Joseph back into the program. I love that. He's, he, listen, he's been handpicked like Mary. And, and this is a go around. Let me tell you, if Joseph don't get aboard now, Joseph's in deep trouble. Not by discipline, 
because the Lord tells them, Jalo's it, not by discipline, but he's not going to get to participate in one of the greatest events ever, in, ever, 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 ever in history of the human race, right? <laughs> if you study the human race, you know it. He gets to participate in one of the greatest human events in the world, and he's been handpicked for it. And it doesn't fall on his shoulders except to walk it out by faith. Then, then Gabriel told Joseph how Mary became pregnant by the Holy Spirit and the child would be the Messianic Savior. I mean, jeez. You know, Mary couldn't believe it. Neither would, jo neither would Joseph. I mean, God picked two people that were unknown. He wasn't the, they, they weren't crowned to anything when they were in high school. Uh, nerds and left outs, maybe. People who walk for the Lord, not, not denying their faith. Think how that works in peer group levels in high school. Trying to get kids to walk it, not fold. And you raised some, didn't you? You know how difficult this is. Yeah, how difficult it is. Listen, these two kids, but God picked them. And they're, listen, their names are going to be recorded in time and eternity. These two kids are going to be, these two kids, you know, they, they grew up in doctrinal studies and they went to camp and they sold out for the Lord. They didn't get a lot of dates because... They didn't do what everybody else is going to do. They're not going to run with everybody and go out and get drunk on the weekends, and, and they're not going to do all that stuff. They're going to walk the walk. And they're going to be criticized for it, and they're going to be called goody two-shoes and all this kind of stuff. And God's got his hand on them for events in their life that they couldn't even imagine. They, God has stuff planned. Listen, it's true for your life and mine. God has taken you places and he has, he has connected you with people and, and done things with your life and is still doing them with you that is so far out there you could have never imagined. Could you imagine ever where you are today and what you're doing uh, when you were uh, in the ninth grade? No, me either. I mean, I couldn't imagine when I was older than that. Do what? Note that Gabriel's doctrinal message didn't address, and I love this. Notice that Gabriel's doctrinal message didn't address Joseph's self-induced misery. He didn't say, now, son, if you do this, you'll just be, you'll be hunky-dory. He didn't do that. But listen, but it did address the correct response to the directive will of God regarding Mary's pregnancy. He said, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. He didn't tell me you're going to feel better in the morning. He didn't say, if you'll do this, or you'll, you know. He, he, there was no it, it, give and takes on this deal. If you do this, God will do this and this and this and that and that. He didn't do that. God doesn't do that stuff. People do it, but God doesn't do it. And Gabriel certainly couldn't do it. Here's my final point. God gives us a great Christmas doctrinal gift from Joseph's experience this year. At least I feel that way in my heart. heart. This has been a wonderful series of my soul. In 2 Timothy 2.13, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. That's why you can't lose your salvation. That's why you can't take yourself out of the plan of God. Without a lot of divine intervention, you have no idea how hard God works to keep us on track. We call them grace operating assets that we have available to our life. I love the principle that God is with you, Emmanuel. I love that principle of the Christmas story. You very seldom hear the, that, but I love that. I walked away from this this year's messages with that idea, Emmanuel. I love the sound of that anyhow, Emmanuel. God is with you, whether you know, practice, or believe it. Wasn't that true for Joseph? 
God is with you and will never leave you nor forsake you, even though you might him. God is faithful, whether you are faithful or faithless. I've learned that once again. I mean, what, was, what is God's choice for you, for you to be faithful? What does he do if you're not? He works really hard to bring you back in the fold. And, and, he, and listen, he'll do it in a lot of different ways. He'll use tough love and tender love and all the T loves. But, and you ought to read Hebrews 13, 20 through 21. I recommend that. What you don't realize when you read 2 Timothy the second chapter 13, and this I want you to do is home study for yourself. There are four. This is one of four trustworthy sayings, which are doctrinal promises and, and, and manifest the character of God to your life. This is a, a wonderful study in itself that we'll do one time. The main message, when you look at the context of this passage, that goes back to verse 8. The main message behind these trustworthy statements is for spiritually advancing believers who are going through unbelievable hardships of undeserved suffering. And listen, we know a lot of people like that, do we not? I mean, our, our prayer chain is loaded with these people. And listen, and tons of them that are not on our prayer chain that we pray for. And you know what they don't know? They don't know these trustworthy statements. You need to really look at those. And when you find these people, they need to know this. And, and what you're going to find, you're going to find four ifs. They're called couplets. This is a, a, a hymn. You know, it's a music. This, this was a Christian hymn, this trustworthy sayings all of the ifs they're all going to begin with if and that's a first class condition which means if it's true in the if part it's true in the then part and it would when you look at that again and and this was written as a as a hymn in the early church because the church was being so persecuted and the church was being so persecuted for their faith. We are so blessed in America to have the protection of the freedom of liberty of, of uh, worship. We are, we are so blessed by that. You want to pay attention to that. This is a wonderful. You want to read from verses 18. I don't know if I wrote this down there, but it, 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 it goes from about 8 through this section. It starts up in about 8, if I remember right. So let me conclude. God desired to teach Joseph how to live. If you, if you look at those four things, I'll, if you look at the four if, the, cop, the, 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 the four ifs in that trustworthy statement, you're going to find that God desires to teach Joseph as well as us how to live by faith how to endure by faith, how to be faithful through undeserved suffering. And for Joseph, self-induced misery. You don't need to stay in that muck and mire. Step out of it. Do you know what was interesting? Yeah, I don't know that I, I did this. Well, maybe I did. Watch this. I'm going to close with this one. God walked Joseph out of a self-inflicted crisis by grace. He got himself in this muck and mire, and I can't sleep. Oh, I don't know. Right? All the self-induced misery. God walked him out of a self-inflicted crisis by grace through faith. Because Joseph was positive in his heart to do the will. It's not from his, from his here. It's from his heart. There should be a T on that word. <laughs> How to be a T on it. Okay? Well... As far as I can get tonight, guys. Guys, thank you. All right, let's uh, have a word of prayer, and then we'll have our prayer time as a church. Well, Father, we're thankful tonight to look at the story of Joseph and Mary and the birth story of Christ. 
just ordinary people like we are who got saved by grace and became extraordinary people in the plan of God. Never, ever, apart from salvation in Christ, would we ever be the extraordinary people in the plan of God that we are today. And every person that's in there that understands that they are in the flow of the motion of the will of God in the plan of God throughout our period of time on earth, then we know that we've become exceptional people because of the grace of God and the will of God actively engaged within our life. What a wonderful thing that is to know that. Just ordinary people that have become extraordinary in the plan of God. I learned that from Joseph and Mary. I mean, why was the baby, why did, why was the baby in the barn? He said, well, there was no room in the end. Mm, it would have probably took their life savings to have it anyhow. But it's just ordinary people. Ordinary people. And Joseph is a carpenter. Just an ordinary person. He wasn't somebody who worked in the state department or any of that wasn't a big theologian, none of that. Just ordinary people, kind of like the shepherds. But they were extraordinary because of their faith. And God used them in extraordinary ways because they were open to his will. And we learn that today. Just ordinary people. called to be extraordinary in Christ, in the plan of God. I want to thank you for that, Father. I want us to understand that. I don't care how the world tags us. I don't how how they identify us. I don't even care how our family identifies us. I don't even care how our neighbors identify us, nor how we even sometimes identify ourselves. If we believe that Jesus died for our sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day, and we believe that for our salvation, we have just moved ourselves out of ordinary people into extraordinary people because of our salvation in Christ. We are now headed for great things in the plan of God as far as the plan of God, and that's what makes us extraordinary, wonderful people. And I pray about that. I pray that for each of us here today. I want people to call you ordinary people. You've been saved by the grace of God. And they don't have to be ordinary people. They can be, they can be saved by grace and become extraordinary. We are, we are children of God. We're, we're priesthood. We're ambassadors of Christ on this earth. There are so many things we are, Father, as extraordinary people because we got saved. I pray that today over those who have attended with us tonight and those who have come by the internet. Don't put this. You want a great Christmas gift? God is God. He'll take you from ordinary to extraordinary the moment you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. We're looking for extraordinary people, Father. That's who we're looking for in this church. In Jesus' name, amen.